Father, thank you for patience and flexibility and even for Zoom, Lord. And um, we look forward to diving into this word, Lord, in chapter 21. Bless Bob as he brings it to us in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right, Bob, it's all yours. Yeah. yeah this is like I've been in some meetings when you got a half hour, 20 minutes, and somebody gets up and gives you an introduction, it takes seven, eight minutes. I'm like, <laughs> I mean, yeah, let me get my hands on this guy. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay, we're in chapter 21. Uh, chapter 21 is kind of straightforward. You know, there's uh, some interesting things go on, but it's not a lot of difference in uh, theological things, in terms just reaffirming what the brethren in Jerusalem had decided in chapter 15. So Paul is heading that direction, and he has quite a group with him. And remember, they're taking an offering from the churches in Asia Minor and Greece and places to give to the church and the people in Jerusalem. Interesting thing, it doesn't pop up too much here, just subtly, and so we'll talk about that. 21, we'll go to 1. And when it had come about that he had parted from them and had set sail, they ran straight Corsica and then next day to Rhodes and therefore uh, to Para. And having found a ship and crossing over to Phoenicia, they went abroad and set sail. And when he had come in sight of Cyprus, leaving it on the left and keeping sailing to Syria and landed in Tyre, for there was a ship that was to unload its cargo. Now, Tyre, I've been there once. It's nothing like it was at once. It kind of had a an island, almost a man-made island out, which kind of protected it. But but uh, Alexander destroyed the city I mean, for whatever reason. But they kind of the Romans redid it. But what they use it for, the city of Rome needed food. You know, they they didn't work much. You know, they had government protecting them. So they took the grain from Israel and the Palestine, and it went to Tyre, then it went to Rome to feed the Romans. And so that's why Caesar was always concerned about this part of the world. So Tyre was that kind of city. And after looking up the disciples and staying there seven days, they kept telling Paul through the spirit not to set foot in Jerusalem. Okay, we're going to hear this a couple of times. And when it came about that uh, our days that there were ended, we departed and started on our journey while all with wives and children. And that's interesting. Luke kind of brings the whole family in this, escorted us, and we were out at the city. And when he leaned down on the beach and praying, we said farewell to one another. And we went on board the ship and they returned to home again. Now, what they're going to do, they're going to sail down the Mediterranean. They're going to sail down the coast, you know, from Tyre down to Caesarea. So you can see that all the details that are coming. And when they had finished the voyage from Tyre, we arrived at Potomus. And after greeting their brethren, we stayed with them for a day. And the next day we departed and came to Caesarea and entering the house of Philip the Evangelist. He was one of the seven. We stayed with him. Now, Caesarea was more or less kind of the port city for Jerusalem. And so they landed there. And it's interesting. Here's and they, one of the seven. One of the evangelists, remember him. And the, speaking to the, the eunuch from Ethiopia and then doing other great things. All of a sudden, he lives there. And interestingly, he's a good and daughters who were prophetesses. Wow, what a wonderful family. So he's a good man, good family. We don't know much about his wife, but obviously she was a, a good mom that raised her kids. And we, a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea, okay, probably Jerusalem, and coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, this is what the Holy Spirit says. In this way, the Jews of Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. And when we heard this, we as well as the local residents began begging him not to go to Jerusalem. 
Okay, now here's, here's an interesting thing that sometimes has confused people. Here you got two different words of the spirit. You know, you got Agabus and not only him, but other people say, Paul, don't go to Jerusalem. You know, they're out to get you. But Paul and his spirits says, I need to go. Remember, go not knowing all the things that will befall me. But he said, I need to go there because that's somehow what the spirit had told him. So some may think, well, there's a conflict in the spirit. Well, not really. If you really kind of look at it, Agabus just said, this is what's going to happen. And Paul kind of knew that was going to happen, but that wasn't going to deter him from what the Holy Spirit told him. So there's no conflict. It's just Paul knew he was walking into the lion's den and he was well prepared for that. Now, catch this. He has missionary journeys have ended right now. The third missionary journey is over. One, two, three, traveled all over Asia Minor. Now he's not out preaching you know, like he was and planting churches. Now he's going to somehow help even Rome understand what's going to take place and some of the officials. Okay, uh, verse 13. Then Paul answered, what are you doing weeping and breaking my heart? <laughs> for I am ready not only to be bound, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And since he would not be persuaded, we felt silent, remarking, we, this is Luke, he was also a part of that, the will of the Lord be done. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's the best answer. God, your will be done. We acknowledge that thy will be done. And so they didn't want him because they loved this guy. And they knew he was walking into a situation where people hated him. And after these days, we got ready and started on our journey up to Jerusalem. It's about 63 miles from Caesarea to Jerusalem. So it's, it's not a long trip, but when you're walking, it's a long trip. <laughs> it's not like riding a bus or a car. And some of the disciples from Caesarea also came with us taking us to Manson of Cyprus, a disciple of long standing with whom we were to lodge. So along the way, they were staying with a Christian brother and probably broke their trip up that way so they could make it easily. And when we had come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. Yeah, they got money. <laughs> you know, they're they're going to help feed the poor and the families that are in trouble. And now the following day, Paul was went with us to James and all the elders were present. So here's a great meeting. James, the pastor of the church in Jerusalem, who was later beheaded by Herod, you know, who just wanted to gain points with the Jews. But this is a great brother. And obviously he gave us, you know, his letters that we can read about his view of Jesus. And after he had greeted them, he began to relate one by one the things which God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. Wouldn't you have liked to have been there? Paul's well, going to give this. Hey, this is what happened here. This is what happened in Thessalonica. This is what happened in Berea. Uh, this is what happened in Ephesus. You know, we got beat up bad, but the church was established. I mean, it would have been fun to be there and to hear this report. And when they heard it, they began glorifying God. And they said to him, you see, brethren, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed, and they are all zealous for the law. Now, the word there may be many thousands, but it's interesting. The gospel is going forward. It's growing. It's taking over the Roman Empire, and it will in about 300 A.D., so, you know, this is a marvelous report of what's going on. And they have been told about you that you are teaching all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children, not to walk according to the customs. No, not true. What then is to be done? They will certainly hear that you are, you have come. Now, Paul never did that. You know, it is true that Titus, excuse me, no, that Timothy 
who was a Jewish mom and a Greek dad, he circumcised him, but in Titus, he didn't because he was a Greek. So I'm, it's interesting, you know, rumors, you know, I've been in a few church splits. It's all rumors. I mean, just crazy stuff. People begin to agitate each other and not tell the truth. And it's really, really sad that Paul had, Paul had done everything he can to follow the Jewish law for himself per personally. He did purification. He did all of that. But somehow people want to hurt him. So they begin to give out these lies. Verse 23. Therefore, do this that we tell you. We have four men who are under a vow. Again, Nazarite vow. These are these vows are usually 30 days in. And so uh, Paul can't not really do a Nazarite vow, but some somehow he's going to participate in this. And this is their solution to quieting down and saying, Paul, you really are following the Jewish laws. Therefore, do this is that we tell you, take these four men who are under the a vow, take them, purify yourself along with them and pay their expenses in order that they may save and shave their heads and all will know that there is nothing to the things which they have been told about you, but that you yourself also walk orderly, keeping the law. Now, in a Nazarite vow, which was a vow that was made for whatever reason, after the 30 days or whatever, usually that amount, they would shave their heads and then make a sacrifice in the temple and to God. But concerning the Gentiles who have believed, we wrote, Having decided that they should abstain from meat sacrificed to idols, remember that's in chapter 15, and from blood, and from what has been strangled, and from fornication. Okay, then Paul, obviously, okay, let's try this to see if it would keep people from being upset with me. Then Paul took them in the next day, purified himself along with them, and went into the temple, giving notice of the completion of the days of purification until the sacrifice was offered for each one of them. Now, oh, Paul, poor guy, he had to pay for these. He's the one, he, he put out money, all did this. Obviously, the people in the temple, who, the priests, knew that he had done this. Okay. And when the seven days were almost over, the Jews from Asia, upon seeing him in the temple, began to stir up all the multitude and laid hands on him, crying out, men of Israel, Come to our aid. This is the man who preaches to all men everywhere against our people and the law and this place. And besides, he has even brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. Okay, not true. Now you remember, if you have the temple, you have the holies of holies and you got the, the temple itself, but then you have the court of the Gentiles. And so Paul could have brought someone into the court of the Gentiles, but they're talking about into the main temple itself, which he did not do. For they had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, he's one that kind of came with Paul, into the city with him, and they suppose that Paul had brought him into the temple, which he had not. And all the city was aroused, and the people rushed together, and taking hold of Paul, they dragged him out of the temple. Okay, and immediately the doors were shut. This is the main part. They they didn't want to defile the temple of God with a riot. So they got him out. They closed the temple up and they were seeking to kill him. And while they came up, the commander of the Roman cohort, okay, now the right next to the temple, the Romans built Atonia, which was a place where all the soldiers were. They housed them there. If you go to Jerusalem, you, you can go into that place. And it was that they looked down into the temple area, it made the Jews upset, obviously. But they looked down because the Romans were trying to keep the Jews from rioting and trying to start a war. And they knew that the temple would be the center. And so all of a sudden, this, this commander sees this going on and at once he took along 32 some soldiers and centurions and they ran them and when they saw 
the commander and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. <laughs> Poor Paul. Paul. He, I mean, I mean, he's only trying to do good. <laughs> he, he gets beaten up. It's just incredible. He's got scars. He talked about that in 2 Corinthians 11. We'll, we'll, we'll pick that up. He goes through a list of all the, the times he got beat up. Verse 33. Then the commander came up and took a hold of him and ordered him to be bound with two chains. And he began asking who he was and what he had done. But among the crowd, some were shouting one thing and some another. And when he could not find out the facts, talking to Paul, on the count of the uproar, he ordered him to be brought into the barracks and to Antonio, this place. Now, now you, you know, when riots take place, even here in the States today, there's no reason going on. You know, they're not sitting down talking about, well, we did this, they did this. You know, it's just wacko. I mean, everyone does what he wants in his own eyes and to hurt people. So this is what's happened to Paul. The angel of the Lord obviously protected him. Even the Romans, you know, helped protect him against the Jews. And when they got to the stairs up to the Antonia, this place where the soldiers slept and lived, uh, it so happened that he was carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the mob. So Paul couldn't even walk. And the multitude of the people kept following behind, crying out, away with him. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? It's what they did to Jesus. And as Paul was about to be brought into the barracks, he said to the commander, may I uh, say something to you? And he said, do you know Greek? Okay, here we go. Here's an interesting thing. He says, well, you got to learn languages if you're a missionary. Because, you know, so he's asking this Roman, and you are not the Egyptian who came a time ago. And this has been corroborated from history about this particular incident. He stirred up a revolt and led 4,000 men of the assassins out into the wilderness. Well, some historians said it wasn't that far. It was towards the Mount of Olives and out that way. And the Romans killed him. And many of them were scattered, the 4,000. So this, this commander, the colonel probably, that level he's asking are you part of that because they had probably dealt with that in and so he was wanting to know if if paul was one of those guys but paul said i'm a jew of tarsus in sicily and a citizen of no insignificant city and i beg you allow me to catch this allow me to speak to the people and when he had given him permission paul standing on the stairs can you imagine here's paul you got soldiers, big <laughs> Roman guys, you know, probably from Macedonia. Macedonian men are really big. So they're standing there, you know, constricted by the Romans, protecting him. And when he had given permission, Paul standing on the stairs, motioned to the people with his hands. And when there was a great hush, he spoke to them in the Hebrew dialect saying, okay, and then I wish I could go on this part, but I better stop. Because <laughs> this is one of the, the great messages of, of the Apostle Paul to the Jewish people of his life and how he came about and what the ministry God had done through him. And so we'll understand. Now, remember, Paul thought he needed to go to Rome. And so this is God fulfilling that. It's not an easy road, obviously. But we're going to catch some more. People are still going to try to kill him. But God is going to protect him. And one of the ways God's protect him is from a kid. I won't say too much. Scott can tell you about that. That's a great story about a kid saves the apostle Paul. I mean, I love it. <laughs> so we need children like that. Okay, so it's just an interesting part of history. You know, third missionary journey ended. Paul's going to fulfill what the Spirit has said to him, and go to Jerusalem. And from Jerusalem, he must speak to leaders. He's going to go all the way to Rome. He's going to speak to Nero. And, and, and he's going to speak to, you know, Festus and all, the, all these other guys, these leaders. That's what God told him he was going to do. He's going to spend probably a couple of years in Caesarea, where they had just come through, in a prison there. 
and we're, we're probably, Luke is catching all the history that he was a participant of in the early chapters. So Luke has got a couple of years to get all this history from people he's talking to. So it's very important and it's interesting. I, I think to me, the thing that's significant is Paul lifts up his hand and the crowd, the mob stops yelling. And then he talked to him. Okay, that's a fast track <laughs> of this. Okay, Josh. Okay, yeah. Paul and all the people who were advising him when the rumors of him defiling the temple and saying you don't have to follow the laws of Moses, which were sacred to them, when that when those rumors started surfacing, there was this recommendation coming up of Paul to, to take some of these guys who are under vow and pay for their sacrifice and do the same thing with them. And that is, I think, how we should deal with a lot of when rumors or when evil things are spoken against us is the, our first reaction is to say, no, that's a lie. No, that's not true. And like kind of go against it and defend ourselves best we can. But I think that this is also a great way to kind of negate those is to show that you love them. When rumors arise, when someone is, you think, thinking bad of you, when, when one of your neighbors is talking bad behind your back, go bring them a plate of cookies and say, I just wanted to bless you and then walk away. And that is tremendous power. <laughs> they will feel so bad and won't know what to do with it. And it won't even matter. The rumors won't even matter anymore because you're just showing that you love. And all the lies will suddenly fade away. All whatever is going on will fade away. And so that is a powerful way to deal with when you have people who are her talking behind your back or who are doing stuff that is painful just bless them just love them like that like paul did with these guys and it didn't it may not work out as we see here it still didn't work perfectly well but for some it might have and it's a powerful witness and so whenever you have that i that's a great way to deal with when people are speaking bad about us and about the church is to not try to defend and get in a battle stance, but to let our guard down more and love them more. So I just wanted to say that, da. You got to, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's good, Josh. Um, it's, there's a little, a, a little bit more complications to relationships um, when the people that are opposing you are set in their ways and they think they're right. So when I was trying to build this church uh, here in the Berlin campus, the neighbors opposed me strongly. They got a lawyer. They didn't want me to build. Well, now it was only the neighboring neighbors, the abutting neighbors, because they felt it would devalue their property. And because they felt that way, uh, and they added on, well, we'll make a ruckus, we'll, we'll, we won't be a good nay, all that other stuff, you know, it was all wrong. But um, I went and I ordered crates of fresh oranges from Florida, and I sent it to the neighbors, and they didn't want it because they were set, they, they were going to lose something. And they didn't want to lose it. And so I decided I'd have a meeting and I'd call all of them in so we can talk about it, so we could understand it. And I put cookies and coffee in the back. I mean, great, big, delicious chocolate chip cookies. They would not touch a cookie or a cup of coffee. They wanted to show me that they were against me. And sometimes people are so set in their ways, your gesture of kindness to them 
is seen as a bribe or is seen as manipulation and those kind of things. So Joshua, I think you're exactly right. Being kind, really, you know, the Bible says gifts open a way for a man. You know, when we give gifts and we're kind to people, it does. But sometimes, and in this case here, God raised up the apostle Paul and it was just, he was an incredible man and it was an incredible time. The parentheses of the Mosaic law that was only given so that people would understand when the Messiah Jesus comes, okay, we're ready to receive the Messiah. But they got so stuck into the law, they couldn't give it up. They wouldn't let it go. They they were stuck and hard and stiff-necked in that, as Stephen said, when he was martyred. They killed Stephen uh, because they said, look, you got to let it go. You're stiff-necked. And they killed him. And so there was this deep, deep set of belief and feeling in the law, and it was too deep. It they should have believed in the law and followed it, but they didn't even do that well. But they used that. And so God had to raise up somebody like Paul who would stand in the gap and would be able to suffer. And Paul took on that role, and he had just traveled all through what today is modern Greece, uh, what today is Western Turkey. Back then, it was called Greece and Macedonia and Cappadocia and um, uh, Asia and Galatia and all these areas. But today, it's just basically Greece and Western Turkey. Paul had traveled all through that. And we, we just finished the last chapter when he left Ephesus. Uh, he went to Miletus. And in Miletus, he called down the elders from Ephesus, and he was telling them, okay, this is the last time I'm going to see your face. And so yesterday, we talked all about that, and it's heart-wrenching because they love Paul so much. And we open this chapter today that says in verse 1, and when it came about that, we had parted from them. That word parted is a pastao, and it, it means torn away, dragged away. So if we look at that, it's, it's when it came about that we were, we were dragged away from the Ephesus elders. It was a heart-wrenching separation where neither the elders wanted Paul to go, and Paul had to tear himself away because he was so loved and so respected, and the Lord had moved so beautifully. And so then he goes down a tire, and he, he didn't plant that church tire. Somehow that church got planted, but it says he looked up the disciples. Now, he didn't have a Rolodex. He didn't have a cell phone with a, with a call list on it. And uh, when I went to the, Philippi, the Philippines, and I wanted to find somebody, I'd have to go to somebody's house that I knew was a Christian, and I went to the superintendent's house of uh, Balabak Island. And I said, do you know where this guy is? And he sent some people over and, he, and they brought me to this guy's house. And I met the guy there. It kind of works like that back then. Very primitive. But they found these guys that were disciples. And Paul spent a week with them. And by the end of the week, they're on the beach saying bye with their wives and children. They're kneeling down and praying. And they're saying, don't go. We don't want you to go to Jerusalem. The Spirit had spoken to them that Paul was going to suffer in Jerusalem. And he just met these people a week, a week earlier, and they were in love with Paul. And, and last chapter, in, in, in chapter 20, verse uh, 23, uh, well, let me see, 22 and 23, it says, And now behold, bound in spirit, I'm on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there verse 23 of the last chapter, except that the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions await me. This wasn't just Agabus. This just wasn't the people of Tyre. Everywhere Paul went in those cities, people were being raised up and used by the Spirit of God, telling Paul, you are going to suffer if you go to Jerusalem. Wherever Paul, he was so loved, but that was the message coming, it says, from every city. So this wasn't the first or the second time. It wasn't just in Miletus. This was, again, now entire. They didn't even know him. And the Spirit of God was saying, 
you're going to get beat up there. It's going to be bad for you. They loved him so much. They didn't want him to go. And we see Christianity being um, spread, as Bob said so well. And, um, and then we meet Philip again. We love Philip because Philip started waiting on tables. This wasn't the apostle Philip. This was the, uh, the waiter on tables, Philip, the, the server. And he went up to um, Samaria and he was preaching and there was a revival. He went down to the eunuch and he got the eunuch saved. That went to, the message went to Ethiopia. But now we find Philip is up here with his four daughters camping out, living in Caesarea. And um, he's, his life has gone on from the Samaria ministry and the Samaria Pentecost. It's gone on from the, the eunuch. Those are all in the past, but he hasn't stopped. Now he's got a family. He's got four daughters. They're all prophetesses. And they have found um, the grave of Philip and two of his daughters. And so this is um, uh, verified, let's just say, with the writings and the physical grave of Philip. And you, and you, gotta, you just got to love this guy. And so Agabus gets up and just like Old Testament, he gets the belt and he binds himself. And like you, you, it's just so dramatic. And it boils down to they don't want Paul to go. And Paul, there's two responses to that. Number one, when the spirit is calling us, we have one of two responses. We could go and uh, avoid suffering and say, I'm not going to do that thing that God wants me to do because it's going to be painful. <laughs> I'm going to suffer, and nobody likes to suffer. The older I get, the more I want my creature comforts. And, and uh, I feel I kind of deserve them in a way. You know, I don't have to go out there and do all that hard stuff and suffer so much. But that's one choice. I don't want to suffer. I'm not going to go. And all of these churches, they love Paul so much, they didn't want him to suffer. They weren't saying, don't do God's will. They just were so compassionate because he had been so wonderful to them. And we understand that. If, if we knew someone we loved was going to go away and suffer for the will of God, we might say, oh, do you really have to? Don't do it. We don't, we don't want you to suffer. We love you. But the other response is to say what Paul did, I'm going to follow God, no matter how much suffering it entails, no matter how much it costs me out of my hide or out of my pocketbook or out of my energies in life and years, no matter what it costs me, I'm going to give my life to God and I'm going to follow God no matter what. And at the end of all this traveling and missionary journeys, that's exactly what Paul does. He goes over and we find that the devil is still large and in many ways in charge. Even after Calvary, the devil was still, and he was attacking the church through the old, the, the Jews who, uh, uh, you know, Bob just went through all that part. I won't. But we today still have the devil very much alive and after us. And we have to make that decision. Are we willing to suffer? I mean, really suffer our reputation, our money, our um, time, uh, really suffer. We don't get beat up that much, even though that's not out of the realm of possibility. That's coming for us. The world has gone crazy, crazy, crazy. When any person could stand up and say, I'm a man or I'm a woman and change it from day to day, gender fluidity, that's crazy. That's craziness. And yet our society says we have to believe them. That's craziness. We have run off the rails. The devil is, is domineering in so many ways. And, and of course, we can talk about many crazy things going on in this world. But in that, we are going to suffer. If we are really going to bring the gospel to the people around us, we are going to, and I mentioned to you a while ago, someone I, I'm very close to stood up and talked to a bunch of gender fluid people. And they said, we're gonna kill you. We're gonna drown you right now. And it's real. And, and so 
this isn't just about the Apostle Paul. This is about the word of God and scripture coming to our heart to prepare us for whatever's coming. And it could be suffering. Now, I'm not going to ask for suffering. I'm going to avoid it unless it's the will of God for me. And I think that's the stance that Paul took. And that's the stance he's calling us or God is calling us to take as well. So that's my two cents. Bob, go ahead and close this in prayer. We'll go over to the breakout room. Father, we thank you once again for your grace. We thank you that you could speak by the spirit into the heart of a man and he will go against opinions, go yes. against maybe even feelings to yes. fulfill the will of God. Yes. Steal in our hearts this same spirit, I pray yes, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Great study, Bob. Comments, Josh. We are going to go over to the... Uh... Oh, I don't have it, Josh. You'll have to switch yeah, yeah, it. Yeah, I got you. All right. We could say but goodbye. Bless you and nice being with you uh, even later in the day or evening. We hope that you have taken a cup of coffee or some popcorn and enjoyed this better than any movie. <laughs> but we're going deep in our lives, not just our heads, but our lives into the word of God. So we're living this this word. It's a living word in us. Yeah. Amen. God bless, God bless we'll you guys. Monday. Yeah. See you Monday. Bye-bye. <laughs>